Kia ora e te whanau. welcome to Grace City, wherever and whenever you are joining us from. And how special was our Waitangi Day service last week? I encourage you, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to check it out online. Uh, or any service that we've had in, the par- uh, had in the past, they are all available on demand. Uh, this morning, we've actually sent Marg off to go join in one of our Grace City at My Place locations. Uh, we're hearing fantastic things about what's happening in people's homes. So we're going to go check out how Marg's getting on at a Grace City at My Place. Grace City at My Place is happening all over our city and homes of people who call Grace City their church family. Today I'm at the Parkers. Let's check out Grace City at My Place. Well, I thought I'd come out and find out what's the deal with this Grace City at my place. So, leaving Nath behind, I've come here and we're hanging out at the Parker's place. So, great to have you here. Um, Thanks for letting me come in. I guess you didn't have any choice. I just walked through the door. (laughs) So, why Grace City at my place? What's the big deal? It's good to be able to communicate with other people again. You know, like being out of the house, not being stuck in lockdown. It's great having it online, but better to share with friends, right? True, very true. I think that's great for the kids as well. Um, because yet Lucas, they were like every Sunday. They just uh, they are so excited to come here because they know there's a place. They think it's kind of like church. Like they can't go to church, but here's a place they can come and uh, they enjoy the kids' program. So, yeah. Right, yeah. and we are doing exactly what church is. It's when there are more than one believer together, so there is Christ, right? Mm. So we can't be in the building, but we can be in small versions of the church, sharing the compassion, yeah. kindness, yeah. and love, and yeah. hope of God, yeah. our Father. And having yeah. the two services, it means we can fellowship with food as well. These guys get their coffee and biscuits. The next lot bring their lunch together and have lunch together. Not outside today, though. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are hosts and you open your home. What inspired you to open your home for Grace City at My Place? I think it's just that we we love hosting people for a start off. First and foremost. But it's also important from the point of view of the fellowship of the the church being able to come together and we just love having them in here being able to fellowship together worship and praise God share the word and uh, pray for one another if needed this is God's house so why can't God's people come and join in it love it love it and yeah just to, to echo what was said before um, I think the fellowship for the kids and the fellowship for us we, we quite enjoy being around people <laughs> that's great <laughs> Well, guys, um, I'm about to head back to church, so enjoy uh, your time together, and thanks for letting me gate crash at your place today. Glad you're back, Mark. Oh, that was so much fun. Oh, my goodness. The Grace City at my place is just the place to be. So thanks for the hospitality, Parkers. That was amazing. And I hear the coffee was good as well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that always matters, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, hey I've, I've got this question for you, and maybe you want to help us by trying to put your answer in the chat. A famous person, somebody who was born in 1901 in Chicago. So probably the same time you were at school? Yeah, watch it. (laughs) No, that was a little bit before my time. 1901, and something really significant happened in his early childhood that actually caused him to open in 1955 an amazing adventure park. Now, the quote that really got him going was, all horses jump, no chipped paint. I wonder who that might be. I have no idea myself. If you're a theme park person, if you know certain characters, cartoon like Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, 
Any idea? Uh, Mr. Disney. Oh, absolutely. Hey, Walt Disney uh, had that seismic shift for him when he went to an adventure park, well, an amusement park, as a young man. And the horse that he was sitting on didn't move like the others, and there was chipped paint, and he determined then he was going to make sure that no child had that experience. And indeed, he created these amazing experiences for families. There's so much we can learn from Disney. Disney too, about some of the, the values that we can have as, as connecting as family. But that was beside the point. He's a huge man uh, and uh, with a great influence. But for us, we've been talking about seismic shifts, and that's the title of our new series. So we're going to be hearing about uh, seismic shifts that have happened in the church and indeed in our lives. It must have been a massive seismic shift for the early church that we see in Acts. As Jesus had left and they were sitting waiting for what he had promised them and then with the Holy Spirit coming and how they dispersed out, I just think it was such a change for the church as we see it today. And thinking about that seismic shift, let's worship our God together. Jesus, we thank you for you coming to this earth. We thank you for your death and resurrection. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit as it came and we saw the start of the church in that book of Acts. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to come wherever we are worshiping from today whether that be in our homes or at Grace City at my place. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and you would speak to us through these words as we sing them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Kia ora everyone, um, really good to be with you this morning. My name's Cherie. Um, I just wanted to share with you a song that I'm just loving at the moment by Brooke, Brooke Lighted Wood. It's called A Thousand Hallelujahs. Um, just the story behind why she wrote it. You know, she was with a friend of hers, Phil Wickham, and they were walking around this big old church building that uh, was empty at the time. And just seeing all the seats and thinking about all the generations of people that had come beforehand and, and, um, and, and will be coming, Lord willing. And just kind of thinking, wow, there must have been like a, so many hallelujahs in this place. You know, a thousand hallelujahs. And it just keeps getting me um, excited thinking we're part of a bigger picture. We're part of a bigger story. And um, yeah, so we're just really excited to have this song shared um, this morning. Lean in, um, be blessed by it, sing along with us, and may we all together just be giving some huge hallelujahs um, to Jesus in our homes this morning. Um, but yeah, let's just let's pray. Let's remember why we give Him hallelujah. Yeah, so Jesus, we want to thank you so much for your presence here. Thank you that in this moment um, we can remember all the things that we can praise you for. And even in the hardest of times, you walk alongside with us. And um, we just want to be so we just want to say we're so grateful. And um, may you be enthroned on the praises of your people this morning. No matter where we are, may our heart, our hearts, our eyes be lifted to you, Jesus, to give you all glory. And um, yeah, be exalted in our praise this morning. We love you, Jesus.
There's so many things we can join in saying hallelujah for. Jesus has brought so much into our lives. And when we have our heart positioned towards gratitude, that changes things for us. So I wish I could have written words like that, but it's great to be able to sing them together and to have that affirmation all over Grace City, all over our city. Some very exciting things as a church coming up as well. We have 24-7 prayer, which will start on February the 27th, right after Vision Sunday, where we hear the vision for 2022 that we have as Grace City. And this is a chance for us to be able to pray for our church, our city, and our country. So all information and signups will be available through the website as we head into a week of 24-7 prayer. And because we don't just turn up on a Sunday, it's week by week, day by day, uh, we've got a journal that goes alongside our series. So you're going to be able to download that and work through with us as we're reading together, discovering together, all about the seismic shifts that have happened in the early church that impact us today. As part of our series as well, we're hearing testimonies from people that are a part of Grace City and how God has radically changed their lives, these seismic shifts in their lives. So we're going to hear the very first one of these testimonies today before we have Pastor Jonathan open up the Word with us. Yeah, my name is Michael and my story is about my seismic shift. That happened to me when I was about five or about five or seven. And the background to my story was uh, my father left home before I was born. Therefore, I was born illegitimate. And uh, and that had a massive effect upon my mom because my mom really loved my father and uh, all her hair fell out. She got badly depressed, really badly depressed. She tried to kill herself at various times. My older brother once dragged her out the oven. She had overdoses and things like that. I didn't know about that at the time. I know about it now. But my seismic shift occurred when she asked me to come into the kitchen. And she called me in the kitchen. I knew there was something pretty weighty because I could tell by the look on her face. And uh, she said, Michael, um, I'm going to have to go into hospital. And there's nobody to take care of you. So there's a man coming around tonight to take you. And and straight away, I was really quick. And I said, Mom, I said, you don't have to worry. I can come to hospital with you. I'll be a really good boy. You won't hear a word out of me. I'll be just so, so good. But I could tell that no matter what I said to her, as regards that, that that her mind was fixed and she wasn't going to change her mind. But what I didn't know, of course, was that she couldn't take care of me in the hospital. I didn't realize that. So next thing I know, a door opened to the right and this guy came in and I knew he was coming for me and I ran up the corridor as fast as I could. He chased me. I grabbed hold of a handle or the oven door or something like that and he got prized my fingers off and he dragged me out into the night went his car to the children's homes. That wasn't the worst part. The worst part for me was I'd made it mean that I wasn't good enough and that's why my mother wouldn't take me to hospital with her. So that's the sadness that I made that up and it was a complete story I'd made up from nothing. Because as we all know, children are really good recorders but really poor at the meanings behind a conversation. So that was absolutely huge for me. And I carried, I didn't know that at the time obviously, but then the next manifestation of it was I remember I was an apprentice bricklayer training to be a bricklayer and I was sat in the shed on a Monday morning and suddenly the foreman came and he said, someone stolen the lid off the roof. And I remember I went red, I went bright red and embarrassed. Not because I'd stolen the, the lid or stolen anything. Actually, I was actually a pretty good boy overall. Um, but I just felt, well, because I'm not good enough, it could, they could think it's me. And then the next time when it, when it appeared was, I remember... I, I'd had a spiritual thirst and I started reading the Bible and unfortunately I started Genesis, which I don't recommend to anybody. Um, and I got to Deuteronomy 28 or 23 or something like that. And the actual wording was, bastards will not enter the congregation of the Lord for the 10th generation. I thought, wow, that's it. Even God doesn't think I'm good enough. So I threw the Bible away at the wall. and I didn't pick that up again for quite a while. And then one day I had quite a few bricklayers working for me and uh, one guy, Bob Corkley, he was an Aborigine and he was such a good fisherman, he was a really good fisherman and he used to he'd keep talking to me, I think, do you really believe in Noah's Ark and all these animals and I used to give him a lot of stick and a lot of challenge but I was really trying to draw him out but he was really good but nothing that he, made, he said seemed to make a big, big difference but then one day I'd start reading the Bible again for myself and I was reading one of the Gospels 
And I was just reading through where Jesus actually died on the cross. And I suddenly realized that he did it for me. He did it for me, not just for me, but for everybody, but specifically for me. And I really got it. And I remember at that time I really cried. And I cried, first of all, with the pain he went through. But then I also cried with the joy. And it was just such a joyous time. And that was a seismic shift for me. But it couldn't have happened without the first seismic shift because I don't think I'd have any reason to come to Christ because I felt I was a pretty good man anyhow. Sometimes the thought of, am I good enough right now? Um, I don't think I struggle with that thought, but I think it does manifest itself subconsciously, certainly. And I think to, to a certain degrees it's held me back. But then again, that thirst for kind of uh, discovering more about myself and discovering my blind spots and moving forward and getting coaching of people and learning and reading. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a draw card for me to get better, yeah. And if you do ask the question, like, what difference has that made in my life from a point of view? Because what I do, I get involved with people and I have certain people I'm ministering to their lives as a coach, counselor, particularly coaching. And the difference it's made in me is given me such an empathy for a person. I have, I, God's really given me a, a strong gift of mercy I'm really able to kind of sit with somebody and listen to the story and really start to see where they've made the wrong meanings. And I can pretty connect with that really, really quickly. And, and it's given me the ability to point them to Christ because I know that without the truth, that lie will always bind you up, it bound me up. And, uh, you know, just, it just gives, it's made such a big difference for me. So I, I'm really thankful for that seismic shift, both of them, the one out of it and the one that put me into it. Yeah. Since the beginning of time, we've experienced seismic shifts in nature, communities, and individual lives. Events happen, and as a result, significant lasting impact. Beauty from disruption, strength through adversity, freedom from restraint. Our world is never the same again. One of the most significant seismic shifts the world has ever known is recorded in the Book of Acts. Gathered in a room, ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church was born. Jesus entrusted this mission into the hands of ordinary people. This good news could not be contained. It spread from house to house, city to city, and all across the world. What might we do with the same vision, faith, and desire? Kia ora everyone. I'm so pleased we're able to connect today and open God's Word together. Have you ever seen a rocket launch into space? A few years ago, Robert and I visited NASA in Florida and we saw the, the space shuttle ready for its launch. And I remember being, being stunned at the size of the massive boosters and turbo engines all designed to launch that rocket into space once Mission Control sent the signal to embark. Today we're beginning a new series called Seismic Factors. It's a look at the first 15 chapters in the book of Acts of the New Testament, the Bible. And the very beginning of the story is a lot like mission control, sending that message to embark, which led to the launch of this incredibly powerful movement of ordinary people called the church. And the story here in Acts begins with a handful of Jesus followers, no more than 120 ordinary believers that sparked a global movement in just 30 years. And what amazes me is that these first Christians had zero buildings, skimpy resources. On top of that, they had, had huge cultural challenges, a persecution, a lockdowns in the form of prison, a, a tyrant ruling over them. You know, any one of these challenges could be like cultural gravity, pinning them down, keeping them fixed where they were. But Actually, in our story, we find that it's actually because of some of these disruptions and challenges that the news they proclaim spread like wildfire, going from person to person, from house to house. And so begins the story of the church. Now, through our series, we're going to be seeing nine traits about this movement. We're calling them nine seismic shifts. And each week, we're going to highlight one of these seismic shifts. 
And to get the most out of this series, I want to encourage you to to download the devotional guide from our website or subscribe to one of the daily emails because they allow us to just slow down and work our way through these 15 chapters of Acts together and allow these seismic shifts to become part of our lives so that we can see change, seismic change in our neighborhoods and in our city. See, why this is so important to you and to me is that this story isn't some ancient history. This is actually our story. It's it's a story of our church. And it's written to remind us that we're part of something more powerful than any force of nature, more, more powerful than any political agenda, and something that can thrive even in the worst of situations. Personally, I can't think of a better time in recent history than to immerse ourselves in the story from the Bible. Now, when these uh, nine seismic factors are lived out by you and me, the challenges around us need not hold us back. The forces of cultural gravity can't pin us down anymore. Rather, these nine seismic shifts are like these giant turbo boosters launching us toward the supernatural work of God right where we live and in all that we do. So are you ready? Well, our story begins this way. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So we see here that this is actually a sequel to an earlier book that the author by the name of Luke actually wrote. That first book is known as the Gospel of Luke. So, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Luke and Acts actually go together, and we might get that confused in our Bibles because you know John squeezes his way between the, the two books in our Bibles. But but notice here, did you notice here that the gospel of Luke was about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven? And the implication here is that Jesus continued to do various deeds and to teach after he was taken up into heaven. And that's the story of Acts. So right here in this very chapter in Acts, Jesus is going to ascend to heaven. But while Jesus might not be on earth anymore, he's still here, active here and now. Uh, He's at work through his followers who are empowered by his spirit. And knowing he's about to leave, Jesus spends 40 days here with his disciples between his resurrection and ascension. Now, think about this. When you know that these are going to be your final words, final moments with the people who you're leaving as you ascend, you want to really think about the focus of these times. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we read, During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So what does kingdom mean? You know, part of our problem with this kind of language or concept is it's not a concept or language we we tend to use today, but it was really familiar at the time of Jesus. So if you lived in Israel, you were under the kingdom of Herod, or more broadly, you're under the kingdom of Rome, and and your king would be whoever that current emperor was, like Caesar Augustus or, or Caesar Nero. And these kings had what was called a gospel, or or in Greek at the time, it was euangelion. And that word gospel, or euangelion, is the word used to refer to the the, the promise or or the good news that that king was making. For instance, an old Roman inscription reads, uh, this is the birthday of the God, this is referring now to Caesar or King Augustus, which was the beginning of the world of glad tidings, or gospel, that have come to man through him. In other words, the Caesar was offering you peace and prosperity, a Roman roads, well-being, citizenship. You see, see, when Jesus is preaching a gospel, he's saying, my gospel is a claim that Rome's so-called gospel or good news of of Roman roads and peace and prosperity, it's it's fake news. And ultimately, it's brought through violence and, and fear and is only available to the elite. And it's this message that continues to dominate the communication of Jesus. You see, earlier in the first book that Luke wrote, we read that that soon afterward, Jesus began a, a tour in the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news, the gospel, about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was the good news that Jesus proclaimed. This is core to all of his communication. So when Jesus speaks to people worried about food or or housing, you know, the the, the things that we worry about in life, what does he speak about? He speaks about the good news of the kingdom of God. So over in Matthew, we we read, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows about all of these things. So seek the kingdom of God above all else. 
See, see, the kingdom for Jesus was his answer to everything. Uh, He knows that this is the reason that the power of God comes to work in everything and is able to renew everything in our lives. So this is why he proclaimed it. You needed to worry like everyone else because life in the kingdom of God, it can be different. See, this is why he would often say to his disciples, you've heard it said this, and then he would kind of quote some way of life, but I say to you this. And he would contrast life in mainstream culture or the kingdom of earth with the kingdom that he was announcing and communicating. And this wasn't just true in his communication, it's also true in what he did. You know, every action, every miracle that Jesus performed was always pointing to to the nature of this new kingdom, that the kingdom that he wanted us to see and imagine through the works of Jesus. So when Jesus relates to, to people on the margins, he was showing us that the kingdom of God is for everybody. When Jesus blesses our little children, he's showing us in the words of Dr. Seuss that a person is a person no matter how small. When Jesus heals, he's, he's showing us that, that hope is available to everybody without any, any strings attached. And each time he's getting us to imagine a society that's radically different and one that reflects the heart of its creator. You know, often when we talk to people about the gospel, we, we think about um, one particular part of it. We think about the way Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven when we die. And this is great news and it's true news. But the gospel includes the forgiveness of sins, but it's more than this as well. It's this claim that there is this kingdom with a real king that's actually coming to renew all things. And that all of our life now comes under the reign of Jesus. See, though we don't talk much about kingdoms a whole lot in life, we're actually more familiar with kingdoms than we might think. See, all of us have a kingdom and the way the Bible actually speaks about kingdom. is this little sphere where, where what you say goes, where what you want to see happens, happens. It's why, for instance, a two-year-old's favorite word is the word no. <laughs> it's why a two-year-old's second favorite word is, can you guess it? Mine. These are kingdom words. And parents don't like it when their kids realize they have a kingdom. But it's actually part of realizing that you're a person and you have a will and you can exert your will. Uh, Perhaps on on holiday recently, you've heard kids in the the back seats draw this line between where they were sitting, between each of the two children, and they declare, this is my area, this is my sphere. No arm or leg or object is going to come into my realm. What are they saying? They're saying, this is my kingdom, you can't come into my space. And what happens if that arguing continues? Well, kids, you probably know that your dad turned around and they said to you, do you want me to come back there and sort this out? Because effectively, dad has a kingdom too. And he announces, you know, my kingdom will come if you can't sort this out. And friends, all of us have a kingdom where what we say goes, where what we want to see happen, happens. So the question is, you know, how's life on this kingdom on earth going for you at the moment? It's not going so well, is it? polarizing of people, dividing around political agendas, vaccines, mandates. Uh, There's fears, there's uncertainties of the future. Our society is growing with this intolerance of Christianity. You know, even in the Australian uh, Parliament recently, one of the MPs there called Pentecostals, quote, a death cult. The church is seen as, as harmful to society. We see God's creation getting polluted. We see vows of fidelity being broken, racial injustices um, constantly smoldering away, mental health increasing, cynicism, isolation. You can add your own woes into that list, of work issues, financial woes, relational tensions. And it's easy for us just to be overwhelmed and forget what's most important. But you see, Jesus has a plan here. And his plan is to bring what's up there down here. In fact, he expressed this in his most quoted prayer. Remember it? Uh, Luke mentions it to us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, here's my plan. I'm going to bring this down here. The good news of the kingdom of God can be true right here in your life and my life as we replace our personal kingdoms and agendas and take on Jesus' agenda and kingdom. 
You see, it should be no surprise to us that the focus of these last 40 days that Jesus spent with his disciples, he was speaking about the kingdom of God because this is what all of his ministry was about. And if the kingdom of God is the primary focus for Jesus and all of his communication and all of his activity, guess what? It's the prime focus for your activity, my activity through everything that we do. And that's why this is the first seismic shift we need to embrace, kingdom. And as we read through Acts over the weeks ahead, we're going to see how these ordinary followers of Jesus experienced the good news of the kingdom and they, and they stepped out as witnesses of this good news. So for instance, at the very end of Acts, you know, spoiler alert, uh, uh, Paul says he came boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that this is what Jesus had told them to do. And so this is what Paul and others did. They left everything. They realized everything was in the hands of ordinary people. This is where Jesus left it. And they went out and they spread that news. But here's the thing. The early followers of Jesus were very much like you and like me. Like us, they too got distracted. Uh, first of all, they got distracted in what was still to come rather than pointing people to Jesus. I mean, we look here at verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to come and free Israel and restore our kingdom? See, though Jesus had spent the last 40 days with, you know, between his, his resurrection explaining his kingdom, it seems like all the disciples have heard is, you know, blah, 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 kingdom. And then they've kind of imposed their own agenda onto what Jesus is saying. That they thought kingdom meant Jesus was going to come right now immediately and judge all the enemies and set up his throne in Jerusalem and, and they would be right there at the leadership table with Jesus. How cool is that? And part of their confusion is, 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 is understandable because the Old Testament didn't mention that there would be this gap of time between Jesus' first coming when he was born and died and ascended and when he comes again the second time, judging the nations and drawing all followers to himself, where all things will be set right. And just like then, people still get distracted by end time discussions. Happens today, right? And we lose sight of our primary focus of what we're to do in the here and now. And so here in steps Jesus and he brings a solution to this common distraction. Look at verse 6. Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. In other words, it's none of your business as to the timing when I will rule and reign. Instead, here is the focus. Look at verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses it's like each day you're, you're standing in that dock of the courtroom of public opinion and you're being questioned and you're being challenged. And each day and each moment of the day, you're standing there and you're simply to tell people what you know to be true about me, my works, my death, my resurrection, the difference I can make in people's lives. And rather than get distracted by what's still to come, simply point people to Jesus. There's a second distraction I see here in these verses too. Being distracted to one group of people rather than being witnesses to all people. Do you notice that the disciples confined the kingdom of God here to one ethnic group, Israel? But Jesus has a much bigger plan than one people group. He tells his followers that the kingdom of God is for everyone from Jerusalem through, throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. I, I guess Aotearoa New Zealand qualifies for the ends of the earth. You see, even the early disciples got distracted by trying to restrict the good news to one people group. It's so easy for you and I to do the same. You know, right now there is a whole lot of segregation happening throughout our country, right? Racial divides. Divides over vaccines and mandates. There's div political divides. And sadly, so many people right now are allowing their views to, to separate themselves from each other. And, and yes, there are restrictions, but none of that has to stop us from relating to each other. Uh, you, you might be an advocate, for instance, for mandates. Be sure to graciously welcome everybody. Uh, you might be anti-mandate. 
The same thing applies. Be sure to graciously welcome everybody. You see, such issues should never, ever stand in the way of relationships or the mission of God. Uh, Don't restrict your mission to any group of people at the expense of another group of people because our calling, our calling is to be witnesses of all people. After all, God's heart is for all people. Uh, There's a third distraction here in our verses too. Being distracted by politics rather than focused on the mission. The disciples of Jesus were focused on political power. They they wanted to overpower Rome. They wanted to take charge. And they thought this was actually the way of Jesus. (laughs) It's, It's the ancient distraction. Sadly, so many Christians have been seduced into the idea that real change can only come through political coercion. In fact, I was reading a book recently by sociologist James Hunter in a book called uh, To Change the World. And and he notes that, uh, you know, when societies begin to fracture like we're seeing right now, everything begins to revolve around politics. And everyone begins to think that the only way to produce real change is to gain political power. But in his book, he notes that real power actually does not come at a political level, which means Whoever is or isn't leading a country can never stop the mission of God. And the reason I can say that so strongly is because of what we see here in the story of Acts. Did you notice, for instance, that for much of the New Testament, a man named Nero was the leading emperor over Rome? And he was a tyrant. And I can say that because of what we know from him from history. He stabbed his mother to death after a failed attempt to drown her. He poisoned an aunt with laxatives. He kicked a pregnant wife to death in the stomach. He he executed his next wife on a trumped-up adultery charge. He married a boy named, named Spurious, and he castrated him to make him more feminine. He was rumored to have sung an opera while while Rome burned, and then he used Christian leaders as a scapegoat whom he had burned as human torches. He's a vulgar tyrant. Yet despite leaders like Nero seeking to overpower and harm the church, guess what? The church grew in his time. And that can happen today when instead of getting distracted by politics, we stay focused on the mission. It's one final distraction I want to share. It's been distracted by the challenges rather than being empowered by the presence of God. I imagine these, these followers of, of Jesus could have been distracted by numerous challenges. Uh, Forty days earlier, Jesus was crucified. It's pretty clear that the Roman and religious leaders want nothing to do with Jesus or his message. Huge challenge both then and today. On top of that, Jesus is leaving. I mean, I mean that's not the way it's, it's meant to be. It's not, not what's expected. I mean, how, how are we going to fulfill this mission that Jesus is giving us if, if he's not even physically with us? But Jesus had said to them, look, I'm going to send my spirit to empower you that's going to go against your fear and you're able to fulfill this mission. And do you know what happened? It's like something, something awakened in them. And they realized that Jesus was placing the gospel into their very hands. And these women and these men rose to the challenge and they pointed people to Jesus through what they said and and through how they lived. And the message of Jesus spread like wildfire. It would have been so easy for them to stay distracted by the timings and the peoples and the politics and the challenges. But instead, they realized that Jesus had placed the gospel into their very hands and they ran with it. Imagine what it was like for for these 120 who were there at the very beginning to have a reunion 30 years later and to celebrate what happened. Would they they ever could have thought that the gospel would have spread to the major cities of the entire Roman world in just 30 years as it actually did? I'm sure at this point here at the beginning of the story, none of them could have said this. In fact, all of them would have said, there is no way, no way this could ever occur. But if these first Christians could accomplish so much in such a short space of time with such skimpy resources, with zero building, with, with, with huge cultural challenges. The question really for you and me today is what can we do with the same vision, the same faith, the same desire? 
Grace City. I, I realize this is an incredibly disruptive time for us. Uh, yes, we don't have in-person gatherings right now like we used to. Uh, yes, there's a, a, a whole bunch of social divides happening. Yes, there is a lot of fear, a lot of frustration. But the cultural forces of gravity don't have to hold us back. Instead, Jesus places the gospel into our very hands and he commissions us, he sends us, he launches us on our way. And even a pandemic, a a culture increasingly hostile to Christianity can't pin us down and can't stop the gospel from transforming people's lives. And so today, I want us to grab hold of this first seismic shift. The gospel is placed in the hands of ordinary people rather than get distracted by timings, people, politics, or challenges. Simply point people to Jesus through what you say and through what you do. I wonder if there are people who you could invite to your home to share church online with you. I wonder who you might call perhaps this week to simply check in on them and share God's love with them in action. I wonder what opportunities might open their way to you as you have that seismic shift in mind of the kingdom, pointing people to Jesus. See, I dream of what it will look like in in years to come as we all look back on this moment in history and say, well, can can you believe what God did through these crazy times? I'm so glad that I, I did not get distracted by the timings or the people or the politics or the challenges. Instead, I simply pointed people to Jesus through what I said and through what I did. So Jesus, help us to point people to you. Would you empower us by your spirit? Come, Lord Jesus, use us with this gospel that you placed into our ordinary hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.
how reassuring it is that Jesus and his kingdom changed everything. The world may have changed since the early church, way back in the book of Acts, but the gospel, that still is breaking news today. And our world remains changed because of Jesus. But who are you going to share that with this week? How does it make a difference for you in your everyday living? And it doesn't end there as well. Remember to download your copy of the devotional for Seismic Shifts as we work through this devotional together during the week and in the weeks to come during this series. Well, as we bring our service to a close today, uh, we'd love to connect with you. If you've just joined us, then please let us know who you are and we'd love to connect with you. We've got some things that we'd love to send out to you and we're able to do that once we know where you are. John is constantly reminding us to promote Alpha as well. So just a reminder that Alpha has started and today's your last chance to join with that course. I highly encourage you to to get involved with the Alpha course. Yeah. And of course, we have family experience. It's unique to Grace City. And we're going to hear what Harrison and Malia have to share with us today as they explore compassion in their neighbourhood. It has been so good to connect with you today, wherever you are joining us from. So I pray that you have a a great rest of the day and let's stay connected in whatever way we can. Yeah. Kakite ano. Whenever I need some answers, God, I turn to you. that you're chasing after me makes me want to run to where you are God you make this journey worth it I give you all my heart when I don't know
neighbour, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Oh, Ooh. sorry, sorry. I was just out for a stroll, taking my chicken Jason for a walk. We've been having a great morning, seeing all of our wonderful neighbours out and about the place. Wow, that is so wonderful. Oh, hey Fred, that's Fred over there, hey, my Fred. lovely neighbour. I'm so grateful that I get to live in a great neighbourhood. I also try to learn a lot of their names too. Wow, And with cool. so many people around me, it is important that I learn how to show compassion to them. Mm -hmm. And compassion is caring enough to do something about someone else's need. Oh. Because sometimes behind the caring faces and smiles, you see there are people with needs. Yeah, and sometimes the people around us feel invisible. It's like nobody ever sees them. Like, have you ever said thank you to somebody? From a distance, of course, at the moment. To the person who delivers the mail or maybe the courier driver who drops off our packages? Or have you maybe waved or given the thumbs up to the rubbish truck driver? Or when you're in the supermarket saying thank you to the person who's packing our groceries? Those are the kinds of things that I forget to do sometimes. Sometimes I overlook people. Mm. It's like, I think they're invisible too sometimes. All right, here's a challenge for you to do right now as a family. What we want you to do is grab a piece of paper and some pens. So go and grab those now. We'll give you 60 seconds to get those supplies and we will wait for you here, all right? Awesome. Go. that you need so our bottom line for today is to show others that they matter so grab your pen and paper and what we want you to do is make a list of people that matter to you you'll only have 60 seconds to write down as many names as you can think of I wonder how many you can get do you think you can get more than 10 more than 20 okay are you guys ready think about it you have 60 seconds starting now fun and not too hard. Harrison got 15 people. How cool is that? Make sure you guys stick around though because after our story we're going to explain part two of today's game. In today's story we'll hear about a woman from Samaria who was overlooked until Jesus saw her. Inspired by the book of John chapter 4 verses 1 through 42. There had been trouble between Jews and Samaritans for hundreds of years. Samaritans worship God differently. They believe different things. They talked differently. In fact, Jews thought it was a sin to spend any time with a Samaritan. So when the road branched and Jesus took the road towards Samaria, his friends were probably shocked. Whoa, uh, slow your roll. Hardly anyone takes this road. But Jesus didn't slow down. 
Uh, Jesus! It looks like he's planning to go right through Samaria. Oh, boy. The day grew hot as Jesus and his friends trudged through Samaritan territory. They finally reached the town of Sychar. We'll rest here. Isn't this Jacob's well from way back when? I think so. More than a thousand years ago, Jacob had dug this well, and it was still called by his name. Jesus, you look pretty tired. Yeah, you wait here, and we'll go into the town and get some food. Hopefully we don't have to talk to any of these people. Exhausted, Jesus sank down onto the bench beside the well. The sun beat down. He was thirsty, but he had no bucket to draw water from the well. Soon, a Samaritan woman arrived at the well. Few women came to draw water in the heat of the day, so it's likely that she was avoiding the other women of the town. When she saw Jesus, the woman stopped and looked away. Men rarely spoke with women in public, and a Jewish man would never be seen with a Samaritan woman. Will you give me a drink? The woman nearly dropped her bucket as she stared in amazement at Jesus. You are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? You do not know who is asking you for a drink. If you did, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. Sir, you don't have anything to get water with. Where can you get this living water? Our father Jacob gave us the well. Are you more important than he is? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But anyone who drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty. In fact, the water I give them will become a spring of water in them. It will flow up into eternal life. The woman wasn't sure what to make of Jesus' words, but she did know how tired she was of coming every day in the heat of the day to get water, of hiding from her neighbors who talked behind her back. Sir, give me this water, then I will never be thirsty, and I won't have to keep coming here. Go, get your husband and come back. This request made sense, because at that time, it was unusual for a man and woman to talk alone. I have no husband. Jesus already knew this. In fact, Jesus knew everything about the woman's life, even the pain she held in her heart. You're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you live with now is not your husband. Once again, the woman stared at Jesus in wonder. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our people have always worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. A new time is coming. In fact, it's already here. True worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers the Father is looking for. The woman felt as though her head was spinning. I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything. Jesus looked directly into her eyes. The Messiah you're talking about? That's me. I'm he. Those words settled deep into the woman's heart. She knew they were true, and that this truth was bigger than all the messiness, confusion, and sin in her own life. Jesus, we got some bread and honey. Oh, and uh, we forgot to leave you the water jar. Jesus' friends had returned, but they stopped when they saw the Samaritan woman. I, 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 I was just going. The woman was so excited by what she'd experienced that she ran back into town, leaving her water bucket behind. Instead of hiding from her neighbors, she shared her news with everyone she could find. Come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He knows everything about me. C could this be the Messiah? The villagers of Sychar listened to the woman. They came to see Jesus and begged him to stay. For two days, Jesus spent time with the Samaritans, something that would have been shocking to other Jews. And many of the Samaritans believed in him. We know this man really is the savior of the world. Even though the Samaritan woman had made wrong choices and been rejected by others, Jesus chose to talk with her. He made it clear that no matter what she'd done, or how she'd been treated, that she mattered to him. And so did all the other Samaritans. 
was so cool how the people came out of their town and made their way towards Jesus. All because this woman went and told them her story. All of this started when Jesus was willing to look past what others would have seen in this woman and see that she mattered because she was a child of God. Jesus recognized her value even when nobody else did. This made an incredible impact. Not only did she personally change, but she also went and told her town and they came to meet Jesus. Just like our bottom line today, Jesus showed her that she mattered. This woman's story was about what had happened to her. And then she brought so many others to come and meet Jesus. Wow. They could learn for themselves about the living water that leads to true life. Did her life matter? Absolutely. Who matters to you? Look at your list. Any others you want to add? Think about all of the different people you meet throughout your week. People you know really well and others that you may only know what their job is. Sometimes we pick who matters to us based on things that might not actually matter in the end. What might cause you to overlook someone else? Let's come up with ways you can help others see how they matter to you and truly matter to God. Looking at your list, we want you to brainstorm some ways that you can show these people that they matter to you. Maybe it's baking them some nice delicious cookies or sharing a kind and encouraging word or even asking them how they are using your knowledge of compassion. Let's decide to do at least one of these things this week. Have fun showing compassion. I wonder how you will do that for the people that matter to you. And we'd love to hear how you guys get on this week. And next week we have an amazing Kidspace Zoom coming up. So stay tuned for details throughout the week on our Kidspace parent page. We would love to see you guys. Stay tuned for the So and So show that's happening after this. And we'll see you next week. Bye. When I don't know what to do, you help me figure it out. God, I run to you. When I need a solution, I have no doubt that I will run to you. I run to you. where you'll be you make me want to do what's right and be the the best version of me to know that you're chasing after me it makes me want to run to where you are god you make this journey worth it i give you all my heart oh yeah okay sure all right that passed me Mm -hmm. Uh oh. There's a window there? Yes! Shh! Uh -huh. oh. Mr. Beauregard has weeds growing up around his mailbox. That's a violation. Uh huh. Weeds. What are you doing? Neighborhood watch! Shush. <sighs> oh, <laughs> look at that. Miss Franklin's walking her dog without a leash. Doesn't she know how dangerous that is? Danger. Danger. Oh, what? Longbeard Carl has mismatching flower pots? <laughs> Unbelievable. Mm. <laughs> okay. Who else? Uh... Is that squirrel trying to get into my yard? Oh, 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 oh boy, not on my watch! <laughs> now, squirrel. Hey, 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 you look at me. You look at me right now. Hey, what are you doing? Get back. Oh, no. Oh, 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 no. Ah, ah, oh, ah, oh, 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 no. <laughs> no, get back. Oh, don't look at <laughs> That's a strong squirrel. Hey everybody, I'm Brandon. I'm John. You're watching the So and So Show. And John is watching his neighbors. 
Uh, I knew something fishy was going on. What do you see? Well, I see strangers, a moving van, people moving boxes in and out of the house next door. Sounds like you have some new neighbors moving in. New neighbors? Yep. What, what do I do? What do I, what do, I do? This, this is a big deal. Uh, I, you could go meet them after we finish the show. Well, I, I can't just walk over there and talk to them. I have to bring something, do something, you know? Be, be a good neighbor. It sounds like you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. No, I'm what not. I just want to be a good neighbor. Oh. Okay, maybe we need someone to help us. Please welcome... Someone who knows stuff. I'm Melinda Manners. I am an expert in all things proper and mannerly. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, this is perfect because I, I, I need help trying to figure out how to welcome my new neighbors into the neighborhood. New neighbors? Mm, yes. <gasps> Oh, now, this is a big one. Yeah. I'll need to consult my great-great-grandmother's handwritten handbook, The Manners Book of Manners. <laughs> oh, let's see. It's in here. No. Let's see, maybe it's... Ah, there. No, no. it's not that. Oh, I took the... Here it is. My, my, there are endless things you could do to welcome your new neighbors. Hm. I suggest we start with the most difficult option. Wait, wait, why would we start there? John, my dear, don't you see? Effort says you matter to me. Right. So, it's all here in the handbook. First, research. How many people are moving in? What are their likes, dislikes? Do they have any pets, kids, food allergies, unexpected fears? Well, those are all great questions. Uh, questions for Neighborhood Watch. Isn't it rude to spy on your neighbors? Of course. <laughs> Aren't you spying on them now? Oh, oh no. <laughs> It's important to know the facts in order to do the very best acts. What do you see, John? Let's see. Uh, one adult, three children, two dogs. One soccer ball, two flower pots. Ooh, a very large bag of bird seed. <laughs> nice work, John. You know what this calls for. No idea. A welcome to the neighborhood flower pot. You have everything you need here to make a beautiful and thoughtful welcome to the neighborhood flower pot. You will each create your flower pot and then you must be able to carry it around the room on your head. Why do we need to carry them on our head? Good posture, young man, is essential to a mannerly first impression. A bad first impression is as bad as sour milk. If you want to be impressive, walk as smooth as silk. Oh, okay. You have five minutes to decorate and go. Oh. Uh, oh, we're going. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you can just put the flowers in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't forget to add the candy. Oh, right. Oh, I Save thought this was for me. Candy? No. Butter goes on yes, the flower. So birds are really attracted to the peanut butter and the seed holds it on. Nice. Very nice. Yes. You're just... Oh, you are very good at this. You have done this before, sir, I'm sure. Yes. Beautiful work. Yes. Now to practice carrying them over to the new neighbors. Star wipe. Shoulders back, head high, knees slightly bent, and walking. Yes. Come on, come on. Oh, good. Balance, balance, breathing come on, in and come on, come on. out, staying calm. Ow. You know, I, I think John can be a good neighbor if he's not balancing something on his head. No, no, I have to walk like silk. We might be missing the point here. True, it's not manly to get so upset. I am not upset! You are upset.
It's Bible story time with Kellen. Hello, hello. Hey, Kellen. What are we talking about today, Kellen? Great question. Today we're talking about a time that Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman at a well in Samaria. That's right. And what better way to learn about this historic moment than to hear from the woman herself? Uh, hello? Hello, and welcome to Behind the Bible. Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down at a well while his disciples went into town to buy food. While he was sitting there, a Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well. It was the middle of the day, and he was just sitting there by himself. All I knew about him is that he was Jewish, and Jews did not talk to Samaritans. Plus, I'm not exactly the person people liked to talk to. Back then, most people just ignored me or were mean to me, so I wasn't going to say anything. Just to be clear, that was not the real woman from Samaria that Jesus talked to. This happened a long time ago, before cameras were invented. I think the people watching already know that. I know. I just want to make sure. Can you let me do my job, please? Oh, sure. Jesus asked the woman if she would give him a drink. Of course I was surprised when he asked. I was surprised he was even talking to me. I asked him how he could ask me for a drink when he was a Jew and I was a Samaritan woman. And he said, and I, I'll never forget this. He said, you don't know who is asking you for a drink. If you did, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. That sounds crazy, right? I mean, how could I ask him for a drink? He didn't even have anything to get water with. And who's ever heard of living water? Jesus told her, everyone who drinks the water from the well will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never get thirsty. When the woman asked Jesus for this living water, he told her to go get her husband. But, but Jesus knew that she had no husband. In fact, Jesus knew everything about her. That's right. I know. It blew my mind, you know. How could a stranger know all about my past? He knew all the mistakes I'd made, all my sins, but he was so kind about it. He wasn't embarrassed or mad or... He just saw me for who I was and knew me. That's when I realized he was no ordinary man. Jesus told her the truth about himself, that he was the Messiah the savior of the world that the people had been waiting for. And that's when his disciples returned from getting food. Yeah, we were surprised to see him talking to a Samaritan woman, but we didn't say anything. Jesus was always surprising us with who he talked to. He cared about everybody. There wasn't a single person he thought of as not worth his time or attention. <sighs> I guess we should all be like that, huh? When I found out I was talking to the Messiah, I could barely believe it. I left my water jar. Cannot believe I did that. And I ran into town just shouting at people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? It was amazing. And I think people came to see him in part just because of how excited I was. They wanted to see for themselves what I was talking about. It was like the whole town came up to see Jesus. They begged him to stay with them, so we stayed there for two days. And so many people believed in him. They believed in Jesus as the savior of the world. It was incredible. That day changed me. He changed me. I just, I won't ever be the same again. Jesus showed the woman who he really was, the savior of the world. And because of her response to him, many people in her town met him and believed in him too. This has been Behind the Bible. That was really awesome. That was a great narration. Yes, I know. Okay. Hey, what did you guys think? Uh, that was great. Yeah, Jesus changed that woman's life. And saved her city. Yep, 
Jesus showed this overlooked woman that she mattered. And she responded by sharing the good news with everyone she knew. It's important to remember that no matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, we still matter to Jesus. Thanks, Kellen. You betcha. Wow. So Jesus is amazing at showing people that he cares for them. Yeah. Everyone matters to him. Oh, oh. Reveal the question. <laughs> who matters to you? Yeah. Your parents? Friends, a new neighbor, perhaps? Yeah, we all have people in our lives who matter to us, and there are lots of different ways we can show them that they matter. Yeah, and it's really important to show them because people who matter to you might not know it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you can show people they matter by telling them or by doing something kind for them. Yeah, even just making time to talk to someone like Jesus did can, can make their day. Mm -hmm. Think about that, and we'll see you next time. I'm Brandon. And I'm John, and this was the So-and-So Show! This is a fish from 1948. It smells like cat litter, which is not great. This is a dog bone, halfway chewed. I don't have a dog, so this one's for you. Everybody likes freshly baked goods. Nothing's as manners like an oven full of foods. The manners, but the manners, the manners, but the manners, the manners, but 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 the manners,